much for joining us on the absolute hottest day probably of the year, probably of the century. Um, real dedication for tuning in, we're proud of you. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, if you have any questions please pop them into the chat and hopefully I will see them appear um, somewhere as we go along. And this will also be going on to the RTS YouTube channel as well. So we're just sorting out the speakers, I'm not sure if you're seeing everyone appearing. Um, yeah, that looks good. Okay, so the future of the TV studio audience. So while we have adopted new ways of working, one thing that's not been perhaps quite as easy to replace is the studio audience and that level of drama that it brings to whatever genre you're working, whether it's sport, comedy or entertainment. I mean, some have worked well. I've enjoyed nosing around people's homes and broadcasting live, but you miss that kind of audience applause and so forth. So we're going to try and solve that today. We probably won't solve it, but we're going to discuss it anyway. Um, we've got a fantastic panel, so really appreciate them giving up uh, their time today. So just to introduce myself, I'm Lindsay Duffy. I'm chairing the event today. I'm part of the RTS TVC committee, and my background is as a TV exec producer director working for the major broadcasters and as an educator and co-author of the TV studio production handbook. And my very first job in TV was booking studio audiences. So I am very kind of very close to my heart how this how this all works. Um, just to introduce the rest of my panel, and I'm going to refer to my notes because they've all done so very much that I don't want to miss anything out. We have Adil Amini, who is a freelance comedy and entertainment producer who's worked on shows such as Catchphrase, Eight Out of Ten Cats, Does Countdown, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and so many more shows. But he's also the co-founder, sorry, he's also the founder, not the co-founder, he's the founder of the mental health support group, The TV Mindset. And I'd just like to acknowledge, actually, Adil's been doing so very much work for mental health and racism on TV, and the seminar's now been watched by five and a half thousand viewers and growing so if you haven't seen it please do tune into that so thank you so much just wanted to acknowledge that but you're wearing your entertainment producer hat today so we'll look forward to yeah, well this is fun for me hopefully we won't, we won't have to talk about uh, mental health or racism but yeah okay. <laughs> you never know <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us. We have um, Jamie Hintor in the corner there, who is from BT Sport. So Jamie joined BT Sport in 2012 as Chief Operating Officer to build the infrastructure, broadcast chain and operating model ahead of launch. A year later, BT Sport 1, BT Sport 2, BT Sport ESPN all started broadcasting from the brand new purpose-built studio facility on Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Since then, BT Sport has expanded to 13 channel outlets to deliver the exclusive Champions League, Europa League coverage, as well as the launch of Europe's first 4K UHD sports channel. So you're not too busy, Jamie, then, with all of that. While you're all those I have to say, Lindsay, that's the most boring introduction I've ever given. I must rewrite it. Yeah, I you know, are about that. <laughs> 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 we'll, 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 change, we'll change it in the edit. Oh no, we're going live. It definitely needs changing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark O'Sullivan. Mark is an actor, writer, director, and he says occasional stand up comedian. I beg to differ. You're a great comedian. He co created and starred in Channel 4's cult comedy, Liam Dean, which I have to confess to being a super fan of the show, which is why I invited you on the panel today. But uh, Mark also appeared in character as himself and as himself in shows such as Eight Out of Ten Cats, Does Countdown, Sky Soccer AM, and he's the co founder and director of regional indie Bingo Productions. Then we have Honey Lancaster James. Honey works in the media and entertainment industries as a TV psychologist and psychological therapist for film and television productions, as well as acting as a commentator for BBC, ITV, Sky and more, and also has an impressive list of clients ranging from Google, Disney, 20th Century Fox, everyone I can think of is on Honey's list. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks and for having me. Thank you. Then we have Michael Geisler, which I hope I've pronounced correctly. Michael founded, owns and leads Mosis Engineering, an innovative designer and manufacturer of advanced camera robotics and virtual technologies for the high-end film and broadcast industry. Mosis product range spans from remote heads, motion control, broadcast robotics, mechanical and optical camera tracking for AR and VR and on-set visualisation. So we have a very well qualified panel, we have the genres covered, we've got psychology covered and future tech so we're in we're in good hands today so let's get started 
Adil, let's start with you. Entertainment shows. What does the audience bring them? What are you making of all this and then doing these shows without them? Well, it's funny, we're in studio in 10 days for catchphrase um, and obviously with all the COVID protocols. And um, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting experience, I think, having done the show twice uh, in the last 12 months and just realising what the audience bring. We film it at Maidstone. Um, well, firstly, I mean, practically, it cuts out a lot of time in our schedule, <laughs> which I'm sure we'll make up elsewhere. But getting the audience in, obviously warm up, um, you know, that's now a thing of the past, well, recent past. Um, so I am, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm curious to see how it goes myself, to be honest, because um, catchphrase does rely a lot on the audience just, just being there, even though they, you think they might not have a lot to do. But, you know, you've got Steve in there presenting, you've got three contestants, and it can be quite lonely in that studio. I mean, we're, we've been asked to um, basically whoop and cheer. And the trick, I mean, it, it gives something, it gives them something to work with, um, certainly in the edit as well. But um, there's also the risk that on the day it could sound, sound like, a, you know, no offence to children's TV, but it could just sound like a <laughs> little children's TV thing where you're all just clapping and you can hear everyone. Um, also, the show that I worked on before Christmas, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Now, then that's even more interesting because the audience is, is very much an integral part of the show. And, and the last that I saw, um, uh, just on social media was that you know they're, they're having to perhaps rejig a lifeline or give people an extra one to make up for ask the audience um, so on that show as well I mean even with catchphrase when when um, contestants don't get a phrase right we throw it out to the audience they have to answer um, so I'll just be there shouting at the back <laughs> so, person um, doing it so it will be interesting I think you know from a production point of view from, um, you know, obviously we're gonna have to tweak things in terms of camera angles so that viewers don't notice, because by the time these shows go out, um, we're hoping that, you know, we, we don't want to keep reminding people that we've been through this crisis. Um, and also I think just from the talent point of view as well, you know, I'm sure um, people could shed more light on this, um, but certainly as a performer, you want to, you know, you want to have someone to play to a little bit, you know, you get that, that feedback from the audience and, and you get that, um, those reactions um so it will be really interesting for entertainment i think certainly on the shows that i work on and i think you know like you say the format points have got to be resolved as well as the talent you know having their personality and playing to the audience and kind of get you know creating that sort of energy honey what do, what do you think about what the audience brings to those type of shows but i think you know as a psychologist i think what you have to think about is the audience hasn't gone away. They're still there. They're just not in the room. So I think that's going to change the way productions respond to the audience. Um, for as long as this goes on, for as long as this is an issue, I think we're going to have to find new ways of getting that feedback and that kind of responsiveness, if you like, that we, that we respond to when the audience is there physically in the room. But actually now we just have to think about the fact that they are there. They're just at home. Um, now, I've sort of worked in TV for uh, quite a few years but I've worked both on screen and behind the scenes and when I work on screen I'm often doing things like live news interviews or whatever and people always say to me you know oh isn't it glamorous you know going up and doing an interview on Sky News or BBC and I say if you could see what most of the time I'm kind of sh you know shown into this little broom cupboard uh, with a little camera and I maybe have something in my ear but I can't see who I'm talking to or whatever or we're in a studio and there's just one sound guy or somebody else there um, but there's definitely a difference I think when we're talking about entertainment I think that's the other thing we need to not necessarily lump all of this together because I think the audience brings different things uh, perhaps to an entertainment show to say more of an information show or even uh, even a, a show where the actual audience is integral to that if you think about something like question time uh, wh where would a show be without the questions coming in so I think it's about how this is going to change in terms of the relationship with the audience that they might not necessarily be in the room but they're still there but how do we see how they're responding how do we get that immediacy and I wonder whether some of that is going to come from uh, more kind of in-depth monitoring of how people are responding online what people are tweeting perhaps through a broadcast or it might be do we have certain people who are put in the room 
to respond. So it's not just the producer <laughs> clapping at the back of the room or just the camera the operator, but actually maybe do we put people in there who represent certain groups to see how they would respond to what's unfolding in front of us. So I think what, what's key really is the relationship between the production and the audience is just going to change and adapt. And I think we're going to see um, sort of that's going to have an impact, I think, not only on performers, presenters, and producers as well, because producers often look to the audience to see how they're responding, what's going down well, uh, and that's going to be missing. But also the audience's experience of uh, viewing uh, different productions yeah. as well is going to be undoubtedly changed. I suppose we'll kind of get used to it in the same way we've got used to suddenly, you know, I remember if I used to go on Sky News, they'd want you to come into the studio rather than the Skype. Now we're quite used to seeing it not perfect production values and, and we've kind of just sort of adapted a little bit. But hey, if we hadn't had the audience, we wouldn't have that amazing cough gate, who wants to be a millionaire kind of episode <laughs> that we all loved as well. So there's all, all kinds of spin-offs that happen there. We'll come back to some of the solutions with Michael a little bit later. Um, Jamie, can I come to you for, for sports? Mm -hmm. With sport, obviously, we're looking at the audience both in terms of the studio, but also the arenas, the stadiums, you know, the drama and, and how they can, I suppose, skew a match perhaps with the home fans and you know, all of that kind of stuff. Tell us how you've been doing remote productions and, and some of your experience um, so far in these crazy times. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun with sport disappearing completely at one point for a sports network. That's quite difficult. But um you know, my whole operation, my whole channel operation that, that um, we elaborated on earlier is all being done from home, every single aspect, every single part of the creative thing. Um, two weeks in, we deconstructed the gallery and reconstructed it across the UK in different people's homes. So we actually built studios or got our talent to build their own studios in their homes, being driven by everybody else from home. So we were doing live shows in that way, which was, it was a lot of fun, actually, and very, very creative. And then... Um, then we had some live sport come back, so with no crowds, so we brought in enhanced sound, um, which we weren't sure about, but again, creating that atmosphere and that vibrancy and signposting in what's happening in the game has gone down really well. And then we've been back in our studio for um, four weeks now. So I've got three TV studios out in Stratford that are used by other production companies and what have you as well. Um, and everything social distance but, but what we did which i i quite like what we did is that is the gallery operation is driven by individuals from their own home so the physical gallery is there but the control interfaces are actually all across the uk in different people's houses all driven live so so when we do a studio show we have our presenters in there obviously social distance and very few other people uh, because all the rest of the operation is happening outside and then with the premier league coming back and this is where it is really relevant uh, to this discussion um, is we have 32 families in a massive studio wall live in our studio so normally when you're presenting live football you have your pundits and you don't have um, you don't have an audience but now we have have an audience and we have 32 families there we've also connected them up so that we can talk to each of them individually we can have a two-way conversation so we're getting reaction um, and we're getting ambience uh, and we get in colour within our studio programming, which which has absolutely enhanced it. And and you know you you get those instant reactions, and we're actually rolling in their reactions into the replays of the live games. So I, I think this is a really exciting period, and don't say that the wrong way because it's also a very tragic period. But um, I think creative creativity wise, with the technology, um, with, with the right approach, I actually think we're enhancing some of our programs. And, and everything we're doing, you know, we do, we did the Premier League last weekend, completely remote. It's not been done before. Our, our roadmap was fast tracked in 12 weeks. What was the three year plan? Um, and it's enhancing creativity and, and it will give us this pick and mix as we move forward. And as things start to unlock slightly with regards to keeping some of these facets to enhance the other facets that we have um, when, when people return. So I, I think it's hugely exciting. And, uh, it's added a lot to our output. I, I think that's a really, can I just ask the other panelists to mute their mics if they're not talking just because we're getting a few sound feedbacks, is that okay? Um, I think you're right to try and embrace the opportunities and the innovation. I mean, goodness, none of us wish to ever be in this situation, but we are at a pivotal moment in world history, but also in, in film and TV 
history and, and production as well. So it, you know, it's really going to turn things on its head. And we shouldn't be too quick to just return to the way things were because we can when we eventually can get there and, and to see yeah. how we can embrace some of these things. How, how have the um, fans responded, particularly in the UK, to the Premier League with the, you know, sort of, you know, in our house, we could wait for football. <laughs> Michael, could you mute? Oh, can I mute your mic? Oh, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think what's really interesting, so I'm a football purist. I'd never thought enhanced sound was the right approach, if I'm honest, at the start. Um, about 80% of our audience, because we, we offer choice, choose the enhanced sound feed. Um, the, the reaction from fans being involved in the screens in the studio as part of the output has gone down really well. Um, we incorporate social media into that as well. And I think, I think what's really nice about it, you know, because sport is all about the fans, let's be honest, it's like TV shows, it's all about the audience, it's all about that engagement, driving that, that enthusiasm and that excitement. Uh, and I think what, what's good about this is it's made us work harder because, you know, if you think about it normally, you turn up at a ground, there's 40,000 fans there, job done. Whereas now we're having to think about how do we bring that engagement? How do we enable people sitting at home um, to feel excited, to feel part of this? You know, and we even launched in a beta version, um, what we call Watch Together, where you can watch a live game with four of your friends, all synced up, live video, live audio, with the game all on one screen. Um, so, so we're also looking at how we can still allow people to travel together, travel being the operative word, to a game where they're not allowed to travel to. Um, so I think it's, um, it's all been very well received, um, but let's be honest, you know, football's back and, and just playing a game of football helps me tremendously anyway, so. Honey, give us a little bit of perspective there then from, you know, from the fans' perspective and the viewers' perspective as well, I suppose. I, lo I love that. I, I love what you're doing and, and also I think you know sports watching sports is about so much more than just watching the game it's about the experience of joining with other people um, sort of social psychology uh, talks about the the, the experience of de-individuation where you feel immersed you feel part of a group and there's something so deeply gratifying about that that we kind of lose ourselves we lose all of our worries and we just feel part of this great collective and there's so much from um, sport that kind of enhances that sense of de-individuation from you know wearing your team's favorite strip or wearing colors uh, sort of getting together and having all those other parts that come with attending a game for example that really I think in a way and I, I always love it when a challenge comes up and it sort of confronts us with a problem. And that's when we come up with these creative solutions that actually what you're describing is opening up that sense, that, okay. that, um, that experience of being able to watch it with your friends, watch it with your team, watch it with other people, to people who maybe couldn't get to a game or people who perhaps it's difficult for them to access that or perhaps for whatever reason they, they, they don't feel comfortable being in large crowd scenarios. But what you're doing in a way is responding to this challenge this sort of crisis and it is but responding to it in a way that I think could have hidden benefits in the long term and there'll be people out there that will say you know what I used to watch sport at home by myself I couldn't connect with others because maybe I can't get out or maybe I you know can't afford to go to a game but now I feel like I'm part of it now I feel like I'm part of the audience so I love that I, I, I'm, I'm really excited by that and I wonder whether in a way that might happen in other genres as well that that would traditionally have relied on the reactions of the crowd and reactions of the audience it, it makes me think of goggle box and 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 how we just love to feel like someone else is watching along with us and i think that's that's great I, I would like to pick up on one thing as well that jamie said which which i think applies for entertainment as well is without that audience and that cover it does really sort of make your content and you, you just got to focus on it because it you know there's less to hide behind and and you've got to really hone that sharply you know I, I with with a show like catchphrase or millionaire you know people the the formats there it's just pretty established i'd be keen to see what new formats do um in, in terms of that reaction because um yeah your your content just has to be so sharp now um without the audience giving it that extra lift 
I think it, I think it's worked okay with the with well, it will work with game shows. We've seen that before, but some of the entertainment shows, it's sort of the jokes fall a bit flat, and it, I don't know why because you have podcasts and we kind of laugh along, but there's something about when you see them in vision that kind of energy and I don't want to name any names because they, they might be watching and they might be really upset if I know them but but do you know what I mean it's just how we we bridge that and we will find a solution to it but but we'll see I think, I think it's also something to do with the, the just sometimes you have the, the size of the studio as well which which could play against you you know there is that that sense of it being a bit cavernous without the audience and yeah it, it would I think that's got, got something to do with it yeah, so that's interesting. It might affect the way sets are built and, and sort of how we, whether we're in the studio or location and so forth as well. So that, that's a really good point. So Mark, I'm going to bring you in to sort of give some of the, the comedy angle. So, you know, what's it like playing to a room if you, you know, they're not laughing at your jokes, if you can't hear them? Yeah, I mean, there's few art forms that rely on that live audience aspect as, as much as comedy. But, um, I mean, I... I think what, what the new normal has demonstrated is, first of all, how adaptable and flexible some of the, the sort of the existing formats are, panel show formats, comedy show formats, and also just how much innovation there is. I know other people said it earlier, you know, people are innovating, people are using what's happening as ways of creating new ways of doing things. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's really exciting. But... As a, as, a, as a comedian, and most of my experience is doing sort of non-audience, single camera narrative comedy, but I started doing um, stand-up and panel shows towards the end of last year. And it's incredible how much you, you, you need that feedback, isn't it? You know, you need to know what's working, what isn't, and you're constantly adjusting not only your performance, but the content as well. You know, what you're actually putting out there as you're going along, you're editing yourself as you're going along. Um, it's been, for me, it's been fascinating watching shows like The Last Leg and um, uh, The Mash Report and Ranganation and Have I Got News For You, all kind of going for it and making these kind of lockdown versions. Um, mostly, to my mind, quite successfully. I mean, things like The Last Leg seem to work for me because of the chemistry between, between the hosts and the guests. Um, the Mash Report has worked very well. Um, Ranganation, I don't think, feels very different, actually, because you've still got the kind of focus group element. You've still got that, that, that wall full of people kind of joining in and, and giving their feedback as well as the guests. And um, I, spoke to, I spoke to one of the producers of Have I Got News For You and um, a friend who is a bit of a regular on there as well um, in the lead up to doing this because I thought I, better, I should really kind of find out what, what, what I need to say. Um, sounds like I know what I'm talking about. And first of all, it was a real, a real challenge for them, you know, in just a few days turning around a version that would work in lockdown with social distancing which they did and obviously it had its challenges technically and it had its challenges for the performers. My friend said, um, I'm going to quote him on this, he said it's like handing in um, homework that never gets marked um, doing, a, doing a panel show as a, as a comedian. As an ex-teacher I, I can take that from um, two different angles. Um, I wasn't very good at handing back homework. Um, but the, uh, the, the people working on the production told me that they felt there was a real willingness, not only from the makers and the talent involved in the show, but also from the audience, a real willingness for it to work. And I suppose you could argue a show like Have I Got News For You, you know, it's it, at times when you need satire, and let's face it, we've needed satire <laughs> in the recent um, weeks and months, haven't we? You know, of, of, it, of course there was a willingness for it to work and for, and for people to get on board with it. And I think some of the episodes that they've put out in this series have been their best for, for, for quite some time, personally. And, 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 you know, the content was running out. You know, the shelves were, were running dry, weren't they? So, you know, we needed to kind of keep, keep this going, but also, you know, to keep people working as well. So as yeah. a, this has worked really well and, and some things, yeah, maybe need a little bit more work. Um, Michael, let, let's bring you in and just hear a little bit about, from your perspective, how do we solve some of these problems? What kind of things have you been doing and, and working on? A lot. <laughs> I like what Jamie was saying, that in a way this, this crisis has a tragic side, but also a creative side. And I don't, I don't think we lost an audience. I think 
we have a much bigger audience potentially now. We just haven't developed the language or the technology to embrace them. And, and I think a lot of people are playing around and trying around on a general saying with audio, with audio and stuff like that. So well, we're not there yet and there's a lot to come. And it's quite exciting at the moment to try. I mean, we, with our customers, try a lot of things concerning um, virtual audience and, and, and super remote control where cameramen can be in London but control cameras without time delay in Australia and a lot of tests with our customers are going on to tackle that and um, it's in a way quite a creative and exciting time. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, you know, kind of walls of audiences being then virtually placed into kind of a stadium exactly. yes, yes, yes. or kind of a theatre type of environment. So I suppose that's sort of moving, yeah, moving it on. And I think mm. it's the Belarus football club where you, they're monetizing, you know, people, fans can put their faces onto virtual screens and all, all sorts of all sorts of different attempts to deal with that. And, um, and I think it's just the beginning of creativity. Um, that we're sort of experiencing. I mean, in, in, in football, let's say, you have the, the top half of the image, something to do with that could lend itself for advertising, for, for, for bringing fans in visually, or, or you name it. I think we're just at the beginning on all, all of that. And um, what I observed from our technologies, which was before very niche and very, very quite complex and expensive, is suddenly becoming a much more mainstream and affordable way of just adding uh, virtual and augmented reality elements uh, to images. Um, yeah. Mm. No, I mean, and we're going to see more of that, but I suppose um, good news for you, but maybe not for productions in terms of expense. You know, it's an added expense perhaps to do. We're already finding out that um, productions are possibly going to be 10 to 30% more in cost because of all the added hygiene procedures and, and different protocols. So then if we need extra post-production and, and extra, you know, in Australia, the Australian soap, they're digitally enhancing the, the extras into scenes and, you know, it's all these extra post-production things to do. How are we going to fund that, I suppose, as well? How, I, mean, you know, I suppose that's a question for, for the broadcasters and, and the producers to, to work through. Great news for you, Michael, for your business, perhaps. But, yeah, but the cost of all of that at the moment is uh, coming down, especially with the arrival of the game engines. It's suddenly democratizing and becoming much more affordable. Yeah. Great. So, so how do we think these genres might evolve then? So coming back to you, Adil, so you're going to find out on Monday, did you say you're back on? Catch on Monday, yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> no, we'll do an update. Um, you know, what, what do you think might, might change there? Do you think we'll just have tighter shots and, and kind of, you know, make things feel closer yeah. to sense? Yeah, we will have to. Um, obviously, with uh, I mean, the, the meeting that we had was before Tuesday, so obviously we were working with a two-meter plan at that point. Obviously, that's now been reduced, um, so that does make things a lot easier, even down to the podiums between um, the the celebrity guests, because that could feel quite distant. Um, yeah, but it, it, there's just so much. There's so much of a knock-on as well. Like you know, there's you know, with their makeup and also people coming in. You know, I'm sure you've all seen it on a, on a when you've been to a studio recording, someone has to keep, keep jumping in and do a little. That's all going to change. It's all going to add on time. And yeah, the evolution of it is going to be very, very tricky. Again, as Lindsay quite rightly said, you know, money's a huge issue in this. The audiences, yes, we pay an audience company, but you know the audience. It's not ticketed. It's, it's free. It's, it's essentially, you know, that service that they provide has been quite slick over the years. And to suddenly introduce, you know, new things into that and new builds, it's going to take a reassessment of the way that we work and the way, you know, right down from the planning um, stage and even down to the studios. Will all the studios be able to accommodate it? You know, what's the tech like? How does that, you know, affect the cameras? And you say the shots, everything like that. Um, it will help in, in, in one sense, I suppose, in the, um, it's something just picking up on what Mark said, which was, uh, you know, jokes and, and stuff like that. We, um, a lot of it kind of lives and dies in the edit. And uh, again, I'm sure Mark has, has been there when you think, oh, you know what, that joke didn't really get a laugh, let's just get that out. And I'm just trying to think, oh, how are we going <laughs> to, I'm going to have to use my own judgment, like what? Um, but it, yeah, you know, we, we'll, again, all our senses and we'll, we'll have to be a lot sharper on that front as well. Mm. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, Jamie, well, what about from, from your perspective of sport, how do you think that's going to evolve? It sounds like we're going to embrace the technology and, and, and see how far we can perhaps push it in that genre particularly. Yeah, it, it's embracing it, but also it is and a little help with the catchphrase. You've got to be really careful around how you shoot as well with social distancing because you tend to shoot tighter, which what we are finding is the audience reaction to the perception that you are standing closer than you should be is a really negative one. So actually, we've, we've been shooting a little bit wider to make it very, very clear that there's gaps. And it's quite right as well that we should be representing how everyone else is having to, to behave. I think... Um, I think, you know, let's be frank, fans at games is what makes a game. Um, and I think in the interim, what I like about this, and we're working on a lot of um, future opportunities around personalization, uh, and I agree with the comment, you know, sport is about a social viewing experience. So, so how do we bring people together? How do we allow them to feel part of our output? And how do we allow them to choose how they want to engage with sport? Uh, and we've got lots of plans in all of these areas as we keep striving to take, um, we, we have our own editorial phrase, which takes people to the heart of sport. So, so I think um, that's going to evolve. You know, like, it's like tonight, for instance, so we've got, um, we've got the Man City, Chelsea Man City game tonight. So if, if uh, let me get this right, if Man City lose, Liverpool win the, um, win the league, which is a massive story. So we're going to have, we've got 32 fans ready and waiting in our screens from Liverpool ready to celebrate so so what we're able to do is we're able to show and still bring in that passion uh but as i say it's just it's just you work a bit harder and you know as regards cost actually technology and some of this stuff is similar to what we're doing now um and it's just how you produce and talk to those people but there are other benefits of working from home where you haven't got travel you haven't got overnight stays and and, and yes there is a, a slight increase but actually you, for me, and, and we need to be really clear on this, remote production isn't about using less people, it's about using their skills in a cleverer way. Um, and, and actually there are some check and balances in this. It isn't all one way uh, that enables you to bring and be more inclusive in the people that you're employing uh, and bring them into your process. Um, but at the same time, bring some of these enhancements in that help, you know, and I have got a fantastic studio, I have got all the screens, so it is quite straightforward to bring that in and do that. But yeah, it's, it's more about building a deeper conversation with our audience that influences editorially how we portray to them the coverage of live sport. I think I, Linda, can I just say it very quickly? I think this is something really interesting there. I initially thought like it was quite amusing, but I think there's, there's a lot of crossover between genre now because what you just described as the 32 fans, you know, without being flippant about it, that's kind of what the X Factor finals used to do. They used to have, you know, obviously they had the audience, but you know, you've got your people back in the hometown to help you celebrate and you throw to them. So weirdly, you know, it's quite, it's just interesting to me to see that the parallels are, and that we're, we're sort of learning from each other. And, and I think, you know, entertainment is definitely going to take some cues from sport as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think it is putting the audience at the heart of the show, isn't it? it it's given them the ownership still, whichever genre that we're, we're sort of talking about. Um, and I think, again, a really interesting point and great point about you know, this is a bit of a game changer. Jobs we were told could never be done from home. Who would have ever believed you could be doing this remote production from home? You know, never. That's going to really change things for working mums and parents, the commute, where you live, um, the size of offices. You know, there's so many different knock-ons with, with that, um, but still delivering that, that impact and so forth. Um, we had a question come in for you, Jamie, as well, which I'll, I'll ask now, so, which you half answered as well. So um, Tim said, did Jamie think about some new camera positions that you can now do with no crowd? For example, remote tracking cameras for the final third of the pitch. I mean, you talked about doing some of the closer shots, wider shots. Did you have a kind of a new choreography? Oh. So, so the answer is yes and the answer is no. I mean, the key challenge for me uh, through remote production was reducing the amount of people on site to keep our, our people safe, that absolutely paramount. So, so we have gone to robotic pole cams, for instance, the cameras behind, uh, behind the nets. We do have additional cameras in tunnels, uh, et cetera, and we do use a wire cam uh, on some occasions, but it, it's that balance because predominantly when you put an extra camera in, you put in extra people on site uh, and actually, for me, uh, and this will sound weird for someone who's doing um, sound effects, but the authenticity is really important. And what I don't want to do is to build a proposition that when fans do come back, we can no longer do it. So, so it sounds great and gimmicky having a wire flying over where the, the fans normally sit, but you can do that for a little period. Does it really add that much? Because actually the fans are so much of the color 
of the game. So you normally use those cameras to catch those fabulous fan moments. Um, so, so we've looked at it very hard and there's definitely more robotic cameras. Uh, we do 360 live as well um, as, as standard. So, so we also have those personalized people can curate their own, their own feeds, but yeah, limitations and, and staff safety and welfare, absolutely the top priority. So reduce how many people you need to be at an event is the ambition. Yeah, and we've had a question come in from Gary who says, and I suppose this is for, for all of us across different genres. So he's asking Jamie particularly, do you feel we should be seeing all the players and managers hugging and back slapping each other at the end of matches when the audience is, is adhering to social distancing at home? And, you know, I'm almost sick of hearing different TV programmes go, we shot this before lockdown or we are standing, and it might be because people are further apart or they're, they're isolating together. But I suppose we've got that duty of care and compliance stuff that we've got to be mindful of as well what do you think well that's an interesting one because because i it drives me mad when our uh reporters say and here we are and we're two meters apart and we're social distancing because we know that and, and i think I, I think you don't need to keep reminding people of that i think i think there is a paradox in football if i'm honest because all the players come out you know the subs sit two meters apart and they sit with face masks on and then all of a sudden they're on a pitch tackling each other uh, and, I, and I think actually what we do need to do is educate people better in, in that the bubbles they're in, the, what they need to go through to be able to be on that pitch, which is different to what we get at home. Um, and, and, but there is a sensitivity, isn't there? You know, we, we, when we came back with football, we were very wary of celebrating too much. And, and the, the, the image we used, which is really important one for us, was there'll be many households across the country where people are sitting down to watch this game where the seat next to them is empty because that person has, has tragically died. And, and, and I think there is an onus on all of us to reflect um, how people are feeling um, and therefore that should be in our coverage, but also, yes, to the behavior on pitch as well. I think, um, I think we need to be careful. It's getting the tone right, isn't it? Because yeah. so we're trying to move forward, but at the same time, we're in a pandemic. It's great. Yeah. You know, it's still unbelievable, isn't it, really? Um, Mark, so future, how the comedy is going to evolve? You know, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Well, I think, and I sort of hope it's going to take its cues from the, some of the stuff that's happening on the ground at the moment. Because obviously, you know, like, like most industries, it's taken a, a, a hit, you know, especially on the live kind of um, circuits and things. But speaking about that innovation we mentioned earlier, you know, so many venues and performers and little collectives of people have now sort of transferred online and are doing things that, that maybe they wouldn't have considered had it not been for this crisis. Talking about um, sort of the audience being there, Honey was saying earlier, and, and, and different ways of kind of involving them. You know, I've been, I've been watching some stuff that, I've, well, I've, I've seen some comedians, you know, do a kind of a, an audience-less set and that kind of works okay. Then I've seen um, some kind of online comedy clubs doing, um, you know, having having a, a sort of a small selected audience as part of their Zoom um, sort of a wall of people. And you get a bit of feedback from that. Um, there are some that are kind of really involving them, you know, having sort of passed the parcel. Um, um, I don't know how they do it um, as part of their Zoom thing. So they're actually kind of passing to, I, again, I don't know how, how they do it. Um, but obviously their own parcels haven't they I've just worked that out now saying it well done me um and then there, there are people like um uh, is it fox dog studios I don't know if you've come across them they make um kind of online comedy content and they've, they've built this machine that they can let their viewers who are watching control from a phone and it can fire a vegan hot dog into a target in their garden and as ridiculous as that sounds, the fact that you've got someone watching, able to control this, and they're really part of it, I think there's something in that. And I hope that some of these things kind of carry on post um, all of this. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to some other producers, asking them that question, you know, do you think it all just ends when, when we emerge into the sunlight? And they're, they're saying, no, they don't think it will. There's just very quickly, there's also, and someone else mentioned it earlier, there's, there's a bit of uh, democratization happening as well in terms of comedy venues. You know, you might get a small provincial comedy club in a town nowhere near any of the major cities saying, well, you know, of course we've got four white male middle-aged um, um, comedians, you know, because that's kind of all we can get at this venue at this time. 
And actually by going online, they can have anyone from anywhere, you know, from any background, any gender taking part. And I think that's really good and really important. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming in, so I'm going to put a few in, and maybe Honey and, and uh, Mark, you might want to answer this one. So David says, I have a gut feeling as an ex-studio director that lack of audience in the studio will surely have a major impact on presenters and performers. Will canned laughter and reactions be allowed? Otherwise, programmes will fall flat. Honey, what do you think, you know, for the, from the presenter's point of view? Yeah, actually, I was, I was going to say that earlier when, when you were talking, Jamie, that... I think we're talking a lot about what are the cost implications going to be and and I'm no sort of financier at all but I think in terms of the emotional cost and I think you know there is a loss uh, for both the audience or an individual member of the audience to lose out on the experience of sharing something with others alongside you there's a great um sense of kind of emotional satisfaction when you laugh at something and the person next to you also laughs or when you cheer at something and the person sitting alongside you also cheers there is a real deep sort of sense of gratification that you're in this together but i also think there is an emotional cost to performers to presenters to comedians to those people who really they are performing on the basis of a kind of social fuel. When we get the responsiveness from someone else, even, even as I'm speaking now, when you see somebody nod their head or just move in towards you, it's very subtle, but it's a subconscious kind of encouragement. It's like a cheerleader saying, yes, let's have more of that. Let's, you know, let's hear more of that. And I think when you are a performer, and even if you're not traditional, you know, traditional kind of performer, like an actor or a comedian, even if you are a presenter, even if you are an expert and you speak in the media, you need that fuel from whoever is listening to you to give you the energy and the encouragement to go forward. Because let's face it, it's not always easy to put yourself in front of an audience, even if they're not actually there, even if you're looking down the lens of the camera, it's not easy. So you need that encouragement and you need that energy and, and and I think definitely if this is going to last and I think there will be some long-lasting changes that come from this even if we sort of go back in a few years time to something where we're not thinking about this all the time I think there will be some changes but I think what we need to hold on to we need to find some way where our presenters our performers our, our TV pundits can get an immediate response of some sort because otherwise I think it's going to be extremely draining and tiring for them to perform and I know I've seen I mean I work with uh, some actors some comedians a couple of politicians people who present if you like for a living and they're saying I just feel like the wind has gone from beneath my wings I just feel deflated I'm energyless and that is what I think is the emotional cost if we take the audience out of the room so we have to find a way of keeping that connection going I think about because suddenly it's not fun anymore if you're not getting that that energy and, and feeding with that mm. um, got more questions coming in Michael you might want to pick up this one but perhaps the rest of the panel also which innovations do you think are improvements that will stay in place for years even when social distancing stops I think we're definitely gonna oh, zoom is one of those or any sort of virtual uh, bring people together um, and I think we're gonna have much more of that uh, is the <laughs> I personally won't travel that much anymore for meetings. I mean, why should I spend a whole day or half a day to go to the city and then come back? And um, it's much more efficient. And, and I think we learned to to know people as well through that medium. And that is now through personal conversations uh, with Zoom or other platforms. But equally, I think that the, the virtual aspect, virtual filming, virtual production will have a much bigger aspect in, um, in, in, in productions now. Um, the other thing that will, um, we have now a system that allows us across continents to, to remotely control cameras without perceived delay. And, uh, and that is now really lifting off. So meaning cameraman cannot travel right now to other countries for sport events. And I'm, I'm sure that one will stay. The, the cameraman will have about 20 times 28 times more efficient time to focus on what they're good at instead of uh, traveling around. And I think a lot of these aspects will, will stay, but it's, it's difficult to put a, 
finger on it exactly what will stay. Mm. Yeah. That's Lindy, true. If I may just jump in, I think for entertainment, I think that's going to be a, a different story. I'm just thinking of shows like, you know, Saturday Night Takeaway, for example, without these, you know, a lot of innovations for pre-production will definitely help, but for actual production and studio filming, I'm really struggling to see how much we will take forward. And, you know, down to even my involvement, you know, a lot of us are in TV because we love that buzz of being in the studio and being next to people and creating a show in front of us. You know, we like all the stuff that goes with it. And, and you know, there's, through the course of the years, you know, production teams and studio teams are the size that they are because that's what works and, and you know, that that's what we need to do the job, you know, hopefully properly and safely as well. So for me personally, I, you know, it would be interesting to see on, you know, what the experience is in a couple of weeks time, but um, I am, you know, struggling to envisage a future where a lot of these, you know, temporary, uh, you know, and then sort of Zoom related um, innovations do stick around, but I could be wrong. If only we'd all taken shares out in Zoom, hey, who knew? Um, Matthew, for Another thing that, that probably could, uh, be more of in the future is uh, there's going to be now much more uh, virtual production where you film with green screen equally when you start using uh, LED walls um, to create backgrounds and there's a real boom now happening with these um, types of filming like the Mandalorian but in order to do that you need to much more do pre-production plan better so that when you come into a studio it's just pure filming not decision making and let's figure it out in post. So I think there's a lot of discipline suddenly happening that will change um, and I think it will stay um, the way we're doing film. We're gonna pre-visualize, we're gonna go plan more and, and studios just execution. I think that's an excellent point, actually, because the way I obviously work with university students and how we train them for the future, we never would have thought of sort of visual effects type of things for entertainment mm -hmm. programs that was left to, you know, high end films. So, you know, I have no idea how many people you would need for a crew of that size or, you know, the costs involved. So that sort of training element, um, you know, will, will change you know change that area i'm going to take a few more questions because we're, we're running out of time and i'm just conscious to make sure the audience get to our the audience i'm conscious of the audience that are with us um matthew from applause store says um the, the team are currently working closely with various studio and facilities building audience protocols ready to welcome live audiences back to shows and tv events they have thousands of people waiting to attend recording and transmissions and working hard to ensure everyone is welcome back soon so that you know still people want to get get out there and, and connect with with those shows so um so that's good um we also have david saying how do you think sporting events as a whole will be affected in the mid long term future in regards to live audience engagement we covered some of that already but jamie do you have any more thoughts there no i think it's very similar to my colleagues in comedy and entertainment to be honest you know the best experience of a football match is with the fans there uh, and I think when they're able safely to travel, we'll, we'll hopefully um, we'll welcome them back. You can't replace that. And uh, I, I think, you, you know, in answer to your previous question about what will stay, remote production absolutely um, will stay. And, and the opportunity that's going to bring for a more diverse, inclusive uh, workforce and also help keep our planet a bit greener because the sports production industry is notoriously dirty. Uh, because of all the trucks traveling everywhere so so I think there are some really positives coming out of it but you know when we can for our, sh our shows where we have audiences when we can welcome them back we will uh, because because it's, it's it works and that engagement as was highlighted earlier is critical I think for for giving the vibrancy of the show which comes across best on air. Yeah. I think that's a really good point the environmental impact which has been you know one winner out of the, the mm. That we're, that we're in when you've seen those amazing shots of cities with, with skylines clear and so forth and not traveling so much you know I think about how much travel I used to do um, with my job that's you know that's that's now stopped so it's good to see how quickly that that returns as well and, and the knock-on effects there um, so so the future we sort of touched on the future then so we think it's going to be a combination of some practices will stay I mean we're still I suppose in early days because productions are only just really kind of ramping um, back up so we might have a sort of a hybrid and I think I think it's really good points about the training how we now train um, you know for media courses and, and production courses particularly for factual entertainment the areas that we wouldn't have considered before with visual effects VR AI, AI and, and, and so forth as well so I think 
things look optimistic, but we're sort of right in that sort of middle middle zone, really, aren't we? As, as the wheels um, start turning, do you think, honey, people will feel sort of confident now? You know, we're sort of trying to show that we're back in business. You know, production wheels are turning again. You know, how quickly do you think people will feel comfortable in and, and working in these new ways? Well, I mean, I mean, I think this is all about psychological resilience, really, isn't it? You know, things life throws things at us, and we respond to it creatively, innovatively. Um, we come back from it. And some things can't be replaced, as, as Jamie was saying, and we need to sort of make a space for that. And I, and I look forward to a time when that can come back. But other things can emerge as well. And, and you were talking about some of the benefits, the environmental benefit. I'm really keen to see uh, the benefits in diversity across this industry. I mean, we all know that traditionally people even working in production have come from a certain sort of, you know, middle class white background because perhaps they're the only ones who can afford to be a runner in London or whatever else. Now, hopefully this opens things out for people behind the scenes, but also people uh, working remotely in all sorts of other ways. But I do think we need to be mindful of the emotional impact. And I mean, certainly, I mean, I work, I run a company uh, called Onset Welfare, and we focus on this. We think about the mental health of people both appearing in television, working in television, in any way connected to productions. And the one thing that I don't want to see as a result of all this is that we already have a mental health crisis really in this industry we already have a problem with lots of freelancers people feeling that they they can't be honest about the difficulties that they're having because they don't know where their next job's coming from and i don't want to see people struggling later on with anxiety about how do i go back to work safely i need to work in a studio environment but am i going to be protected in that way and i think we need to think about that and so one of the things that even before lockdown i was trying to promote actually was better uh, training for people in production uh, often this is producers working with people in reality TV for example but on mental health first aid because I think when all of this is over and when we start developing a new normal there is going to be an emotional and a mental cost for people and that's not to be too doom and gloom about it but we just need to be aware of it and we need to have those measures in place so we're not just looking after people's physical health we're also thinking about their mental health as well and and just finally, one point about entertainment. I think whilst what we see on our screens has a huge responsibility because it influences us, it's also great escapism. And we don't always want to be reminded that we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I think we need to find ways of still enjoying TV without it constantly being on our mind that there is a bit of a stress in our everyday lives. Yeah, I think that's yeah. exactly and sometimes you feel a bit shallow if you make a little joke about, you know, about something and like, you know, you know, I'm so t zoomed out, you know, we're so lucky we're working and doing all this and you feel like, can I be playful or not? So yeah, I think that's a really good it's point. It's so important to do that. You know, doctors, psychologists, we do it all the time. We make awful jokes, but you have to because it lightens things a little bit. You know, we don't always want to be thinking about the negative aspects of what's going on. Yeah, so I think the call sheet will change a lot, won't it, and the protocols and so forth. So we're running out of time. I'm just going to get sort of closing words before before we close. So Adil, last kind of points and, and thoughts or advice even. What would I you think I think what's clear is, you know, even, even for shows filming now, we will be feeling the effects of, um, you know, what we're going through right now. Let's say, you know, if we air uh, a series that we're doing right now towards um, the end of the year and things are back to normal, you know, somebody wins a jackpot on one of my shows and, uh, you know, you want to see them hugging and, you know, sort of present they're going to them. That's not going to happen. So even if you're, you, you know, you'll do your best, but people put two and two together and be like, do you know what, that was probably filmed back then. So well, there's going to have to be a bit of give and take. Um, you know, through the whole process. I think we're all learning. I think we want, we, you know, we do want our entertainment shows and our studio wants audiences back um, to where they need to be. However, um, I am going to be a little bit cheeky and, and say that if um, Question Time returned without an audience, I wouldn't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a few headlines. So if someone a million pounds on, on one of these shows, there's going to be one heck of an elbow touch, isn't there? <laughs> Brilliant. Mark, your, your closing thoughts. Um, just, I suppose, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't know what it's going to look like, do we? We don't know what the landscape's going to be like. I totally agree with something Honey said earlier, you know, about the, the, the need for some feedback. 
especially when you're doing um, comedy or presenting or any kind of entertainment thing. And as I said earlier, I hope that as people are innovating and finding different ways of getting that audience feedback into into the work they're doing that that continues and that and that um maybe some of those things kind of enter the mainstream a little yeah good good point michael your, your thoughts well, i think i'm looking forward to a time where we can we find ways to reach out to a much much larger audience rather than the audience just in your room we're still needing to find the language but let's be open let's find ways let's be creative to have a much much larger audience and connect with them i don't think it's a cut off it's finding ways to embrace that yeah really good point and, and jamie i know the is it southampton arsenal match is about to kick off soon so I, i'll make sure we finish on time but but your your thoughts for the for the future i'm not sure that's on my channel but thanks for oh, that sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use uh, a food analogy, which is pick and mix, and um, uh, and and another food analogy, which is the menus just got bigger. And what I'm really hoping for is we take the best of what was best in class, but we don't forget the best of the new stuff in class. And and creatively, we've just created huge opportunities to really change and get how we engage with our audiences. And and uh, I think it's it's hugely exciting because it doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, and, and what this period has done has given us a lot of extra tools in our toolkit to augment some of the brilliant stuff we did before with physical people and physical things. I suppose it's the pace of it, you know, we haven't really had time to reflect yet. We're just doing it, it's just happening. Mm. It's when we get that pause to, to work out the, the way forward and the bits that we want to keep. So thank you so very much, panel. You've been absolutely brilliant. Um, I hope people are still with us. I think they are. I can see the audience in the chat, so that's good. But it is interesting presenting without seeing people in front of you because you do exactly that. You usually re read the room and think about when the questions need to come in and we're just quite happily chatting away, but I see people are still watching, so we're doing all right. So have a lovely evening. Thank you so much, panel. So, so you know, pleased that you were able to join us and give up your time. And thank you to our virtual audience also. And this will be available on YouTube at some point. Um, so just have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>